to the fourth webinar in a series sponsored by the World Potato Congress in preparation to get ready for the 11th World Potato Congress in 2021 in Dublin, Ireland. I am so hoping that I get to um, go to Dublin for that meeting and that I can reconnect with many of my friends there and also um, interact with new, new friends and colleagues in Ireland. So our talk today is on why you should plant certified seed potatoes and I am coming from that position as director of Montana Seed Potato Certification. And here is a picture of me out in the field on a much warmer day than it is today. Uh, today in Montana in Bozeman, as I drove in this morning, it was minus nine degrees Fahrenheit. So um, we are experiencing some very early wintry temperatures. So the first question, why require certification for seed potatoes? Well, the main reason is that they're vegetatively propagated. And as you all know, we grow potatoes from potatoes. So the first objective is to ensure genetic uniformity. The second is to limit the spread of communicable diseases. So since you are planting a potato from a potato, that potato, the new potato plant, as it grows, is subjected to uh, pathogens in the soil, and also pathogens that can be spread through air, spread by insects. So as the potato grows in any particular growing season, it is exposed to pathogens. And the daughter tubers from those plants then can spread those diseases to the next generation. Another important thing um, for potatoes is to monitor for chemical injury. Um, potatoes are the canary in the coal mine when it comes to chemicals because they accumulate the uh, chemicals in the tubers and then the uh, chemical injury symptoms can be expressed in the daughter tubers. And finally, and really, you know, what we're all about here is ensuring quality of seed potatoes. Again, we're going to ask this same question. And looking at it from another avenue, um, certification for potatoes, for seed potatoes, um, gives you an independent, objective third party evaluation. So you have inspectors, agencies that are authorized to do the inspections, to do the testing that certifies the seed as being disease free or within tolerance of specific diseases. And just a statement, and this is actually taken out of the EU marketing standards. Certification inspections guarantee the identity, health, and quality of seeds and propagating material before marketing. So basic tenets of certification programs. Okay, the first is regulations outlining specific disease tolerances. And this can vary a lot between countries because there are differences in diseases that are problematic between countries, but there are a few things that always stand out, in particular uh, the virus diseases and uh, diseases that can be very, very um, destructive, such as ring rot. Um, the Really, the core of every program is in vitro maintenance of seed potato mother stock. Um, all programs basically utilize um, the maintenance of in vitro stock to derive 100% disease-free plantlets to propagate for the first generation of seed potatoes. And then again, these are grown in limited generations, so there's only a limited number of years that they're grown in the field. Um, we have inspections during the growing season, and in some states and countries, this is accompanied by disease testing. And then really, kind of the, the really important linchpin of all uh, certification programs are post-harvest inspections and testing where you evaluate the um, individual seed lots um, and how much disease is expressed after the growing season and really um, predict what uh, the quality is of that seed for the upcoming season. Um, Another component of certification is tagging at shipment in different countries, different states in the United States. This might be handled by two different agencies, um, but it's also important to ensure quality as um, those loads are ready to go out to the farms where they're planted. And then um, in the United States, we issue what is called a health certificate, and I know similar documents are issued throughout the world. So first off, just starting with in vitro maintenance and propagation. Um, this is our mother stock at our uh, potato lab at Montana State University. 
um, limited field generations. In the United States, we kind of have we have two main programs um, where we describe the classes of seed. And the first is years in the field, and the second is a generation system. Field years is the simplest, FY1, one year in the field, FY2, two years in the field. The generation system in some states starts out with nuclear, so that's the first year that the plants hit field soil, and then after that, the generations proceed progressively. Uh, here's just a quick summary in the United States of the field class, of the seed classes. So um, if you're interested in this at all, you can go back to this slide for reference. In Europe, they also have harmonized seed classes. And uh, they start off with pre-basic tissue culture, which is in vitro, so never see, has never seen any field soil. And then four years classified as pre-basic and then three generations of basic and two generations of certified for a maximum number of nine years in field soil. Uh, in the US, um, all states do a minimum of two inspections and many states do three inspections. The first inspection is generally before the plants flower and before row closure um, in Montana. Then a second inspection is conducted usually when the plants are flowering and just beginning to close the rows. And then a third inspection in our state in Montana is conducted at the end of August, which for our growing season is when the plants are starting to go down. And if by chance we were to see something like ring rot, um, also late blight might typically show up at that time. Um, those are the things that we would most notably see at that point in time. So uh, important diseases for certification and uh, this list of disease in general, and this is not specific for every certification program uh, throughout the world, but in general, these are diseases and factors that are managed by field tolerances. Uh, the mo mosaic viruses are the ones that always get the most attention, uh, especially PVY. Uh, PVY in Montana, we generally see that during the first and second inspection when the plants are more vegetative. And uh, in most situations, it's very easy to see, but there are new strains that are developing that do not produce um, very severe symptoms. And in many situations, it can be more difficult to visually identify. Um, potato leaf roll virus um, is a disease that we're not really seeing much in the U.S. now with the use of the neonicotinoid insecticides, but that game could change a little bit if neonics were uh, removed from the marketplace in the U.S. Um, I'd be interested to hear from European colleagues in areas where uh, neonics have been removed or are going to be removed um, within the next year or two, um, how that has, is affecting the incidence of potato leaf roll. Uh, we do monitor for late blight. Um, blackleg um, in the U.S., some states have tolerances, some don't, but all do note blackleg on their inspection forms. Um, phytoplasma diseases um, in the U.S., we call them uh, like haywire, purple top, um, witch's broom. Um, and then very, very important is vi varietal identity and purity, um, making sure that there is no mixing. And then lastly, um, this is something that occurs way more than we would like it to, and that is herbicide injury, uh, where we get non-target effects um, from herbicides that are planted on adjacent crops or through mistakes in mixing of chemicals and those chemicals then translocate to the tubers and can cause um, problems in the next growing season. Just taking a quick look at mosaic tolerances in field year four. And so this is just kind of a general snapshot of what we're looking at in the United States in terms of field tolerances. And as you can see, the different states that are listed on the left show that there are um, a lot of uh, differences in the U.S. in terms of tolerance, but a lot of that just comes from the different growing areas and also the different objectives of each growing area if they're an intensely commercial growing area and their seed is going um, for commercial or in some areas um, where they're growing more for the recertification market. So really the tolerances for visual mosaic 
vary between 0.2 and 2%. Um, we have instituted a national harmonization plan to set a uniform set of standards so that in the marketing of seed, especially for export, that we have a, uh, a general um, standard that can be applied across states and, and set up a uniform expectation for tolerances. And these are the tolerances for the U.S. Harmonization Plan. Um, and Europe has basically done the same thing. So these are the tolerances for the pre-basic, basic, and certified. And for their harmonized scheme, um, it's basically varietal mix or not true to type, and then virus. And what I might mention too is even though there might be harmonized schemes and plans in Europe and in the United States, that does not mean that individual certification programs can't exceed those tolerances or actually have stricter tolerances. In most cases, they do. But these are a basic level that everybody can agree on. There are also numerous zero tolerance pathogens that um, either don't exist in an area, so countries have a very vested interest in not bringing them in, or possibly they were in an area and they have been uh, removed from that area or eradicated from that area, um, and they may be quarantine pests. Um, so what is classified as a quarantine pest, what is class classified as a regulated pest can vary very distinctly from country to country, and it is up to that country to make their own regulations. But there are some very common pathogens or pathogens that commonly end up on these zero tolerance lists. Um, the first being um, Clavobacter, bacterial ring rot, um, Synchytrium, potato wart, Rolstonia solanaceum, um, potato wilt, um, also um, BioVar 3, or race, race 3 BioVar 2, which is definitely a quarantine pest in many areas, um, Dickeyella solani, um, PSTV, the spindle tuber viroid, uh, the phytoplasma tomato stolber, uh, the Columbia root knot nematode, and then the cyst nematodes, and then the lesion nematode, Didylacus, Didylacus destructor, and finally um, tuber moth. So there may be additional quarantine and zero tolerance pests, but these are ones that commonly show up on uh, different countries' zero tolerance lists. Again, I mentioned that the um, post-harvest evaluations are really the linchpin of the seed potato certification programs because this is the part of the program where we evaluate the seed potatoes at the end of the season. All of the visual inspections that are performed really only give you a chance to look at what is happening during the growing season. By the end of the growing season, latent infections that were not observed, and also titers of virus possibly that did not show up in tests, can be present in that seed and can be problematic for the next crop. So in the United States, we have the luxury of being able to perform our post-harvest test in Hawaii. And so this is a picture of our field grow out in Hawaii. Um, the main picture showing the visual inspection. And uh, we walk our fields two times and visually inspect looking for virus, um, varietal mix, um, any other disease, emergence issues, um, that type of thing. Um, in addition to that, in the lower left-hand corner, we um, have crews pick leaves from every single plant, and these plants are sent back to Montana and tested for the viruses PVY, PVX, and PVA. And this is becoming very, very common in U.S. programs um, that they are performing their winter grow out. First of all, Hawaii is the most popular place now. About 80%, maybe 85% of the seed 
grown in the United States is evaluated in Hawaii. And most um, programs are doing a significant amount of leaf testing, if not on all of the seed lots, at least on latent varieties where the symptoms aren't as likely to show up. Um, another uh, option for post-harvest testing is dormant tuber testing and then analyzing the tissue with PCR. Um, this is a picture from the um, certification services in the Netherlands. And in this particular situation, they're taking a peel off of the heel end of the tuber or the stolen end and all of the samples are, the um, individual samples are blended together. I believe they put 50 peels together. And then um, they are actually transferred then to tubes with a robotic pipetting system. And then the, um, the uh, nucleic acid is then extracted from the um, potato tissue also robotically. And then PCR is run um, to detect a number of viral and bacterial pathogens. Uh, an additional option, and this is exercised um, in both Oregon and Washington in the United States, the credit for these pictures go to Oregon, um, is growing out the potatoes in, um, in the greenhouse. And as you can see, looking at the flats, there are definitely differences in things like emergence. If you look at the picture on the right hand, um, towards the middle, there's actually a picture that looks like it probably has mosaic virus. So um, in this type of grow out, um, in general, they can see mosaic virus and in latent varieties, again, they will do um, leaf sampling and testing with ELISA um, to quantify the virus in seed lots. An additional option is sprout testing and then analyzing the tissue with ELISA. Um, in the United States, Maine um, is transitioning to uh, this type of testing and it is all, historically, it has been used um, in, the, in the industry sig a significant amount, um, but uh, Maine is actually employing this now. And even in our program, um, if we need to retest a lot or something like that, at different times we will uh, use sprout testing in ELISA. So kind of the, the final inspection before a seed lot goes to the customer is the lot inspection, or in Montana, we call it shipping point inspection. And then this inspection is to, first of all, establish grades. And in different countries, different states, even in the United States, we have um, different um, grades designated. Um, there are also um, evaluations for any internal and external defects, rots, frost damage, maximum minimum size. And along with all of these, um, these factors, um, there are tolerances that are established to see whether or not a lot will meet an established grade. In the U.S., we have a tag system. Um, in Montana, blue tag is the highest grade, and then red tag is the um, second highest grade. And uh, we also extensively use the North American Plant Health Certificate. And this is a uniform um, certificate that is distributed by certification agencies in both Canada and the United States. And the individual components of the health certificate are agreed on by the individual states, or excuse me, are agreed on collectively by the states and by Canada. Um, finally, I would like to finish this up with a little bit of an introduction to a set of international standards for seed potatoes. And these are established by a committee on seed potato standards um, that is established by the UNECE or the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And this is just a really, really very small snapshot of what um, the standards actually um, do. But first of all, um, they establish quality requirements and a classification scheme, the minimum conditions for which seed needs to be produced, and then also um, 
varietal purity and um, and methods and certification programs which honor, honor um, plant variety protection. So these are just the general tolerances for the UNECE standard. And you can see at the top, um, these are zero tolerance pests. Um, number two, um, these are pathogens that we're all very, very used to um, working with in certification programs. And then number three, these are the things that you would be looking at with a lot inspection or what we call our shipping point inspection in the United States. And then number four, those are tolerances that would be established for plants at the post-harvest test or what we call the post-harvest test in the United States. So the value of these standards um, is first of all, is that it establishes a uniform set of standards that any country can adopt. And also it sets standards that can be looked up to for establishing um, satisfactory stand or standards for export uh, throughout the world. Um, a second and very important uh, component of these standards is that they can be used as guidance for countries that may not have certification programs in place. And they are looking to establish a seed potato certification program and through these standards, they may not adopt them 100%, but they can look at them as guidance for what re reasonable standards are throughout the world and use them as a framework to establish a certification program. Uh, another very important part of the work that is done by the Committee on Seed Potato Standards is the publication of resources. And if you're interested in any of the publications, uh, the web address at the bottom of the page is where they can be found. And this is just a screenshot of some of the um, publications. And what I would like you to do too is also see um, on the right hand side, uh, this is our guide to seed potato diseases, pests and, and defects, which is just an incredible pictorial guide and description of the important diseases of potato. And this can be downloaded in color online. And also in the um, image on the left hand side, you'll see there's a um, place where you can click for an online app. And so the online app, you can actually look up any of the diseases and then it will bring you up the specific information for those diseases. So um, really, really good resources. Um, the guide for seed potato diseases and pests is in English, French, Russian, and um, Potatoes USA actually sponsored a Spanish uh, version of this particular guide. So it's available in four different languages. And um, in addition to that, um, there is a guide on operating a seed potato certification service, and then a guide on doing the seed potato lot inspection, as well as statements um, on uh, different diseases and different practices in um, seed potato certification programs. So um, please take a look at these resources. They're, they're uh, really outstanding. So finally, in conclusion, let's just go back to why you should plant certified seed potatoes. Um, really, it all comes down to insurance of quality and ensuring optimal yield potential, which is going to, you know, increase the revenue and economic success of potato growers. Um, you will know that the seed meets tolerances for diseases and others, other disorders. And then, again, it's a non-biased evaluation. So, at this point, I would like to say thank you, um, first of all, to Nora. And the, Nora Olson, uh, she is the person that invited me to present this talk today. And then also to the World Potato Congress for uh, sponsoring this webinar, webinar series as a lead up to the World Potato Congress. So at that point, I will get my screen switched around and I will take any questions. Oh, and finally, most importantly, I do need to thank our partners. These are uh, the institutions and uh, companies that are providing significant support for the World Potato Congress.
Okay, I don't know if everybody can hear me. Um, you can chat questions. Um, Nora, I am not able to start my video. Unclick the bottom that says start video. Yep. And it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay. <laughs> I would, I would just suggest that anybody could go ahead and chat or Q&A any questions you might have for Nina. Nina, you can go also to the top and stop share at the top. Ah, thank you. Okay, um, we have a question. What do you see as a major issue in quality? Uh, there can be a lot of issues that um, are very hard to quantify in terms of seed certification, but um, probably, you know, in terms of the seed that is produced, um, I, I think one of the things would be like the physiological status of the seed and um, the growing season in which it was grown um, physiologically, um, how mature it is, that type of thing can definitely influence the quality. And that is one thing that is more difficult to monitor in terms of seed certification. Uh, but there are definitely issues uh, that can influence quality um, with viruses in particular. Um, one of the things that uh, we are seeing more of um, in the U.S. and I know around the world is um, internal necrosis due to virus diseases. Um, and that can be from the necrotic strains of PBY, but also from viruses such as um, potato mop top. Um, we can see differences in quality from um, soil bore pathogens. And also um, one of the things uh, that can really influence um, pathogens like fusarium and bacterial pathogens is um, the conditions under which um, the tubers are harvested. Uh, if they have um, any bruising which causes wounds which can lead to fusarium infections or um, secondarily bacterial infections that can definitely influence quality and in most cases um, those particular things are picked up at shipping point inspection. Oh, I see another question. Do you see North America going to tuber testing? Um, yeah, we are definitely moving in that direction. And I don't know that tuber testing is going to 100% replace field grow out because uh, we have great opportunities for field grow outs in that we have um, tropical locations where we can do post-harvest testing. Uh, but 
those particular locations, um, even though they've got great tropical conditions, can be unreliable due to many factors. Uh, you can have weather factors there that can uh, threaten a post-harvest test. Um, we also have basic land use issues um, where in Hawaii some of our land might be slated for commercial development. So the opportunities to do field testing in the future may, um, may be decreased. So um, in the U.S. we are um, and in Montana, we are very aggressively looking at tuber testing and we are starting to incorporate dormant tuber testing into our program. Um, we are um, using a system where we use um, immunocapture, where we capture the virus with antibodies and then perform um, the reverse transcription and PCR after that. Um, it is less labor intensive and less expensive than the actual nucleic acid extraction and the robotics that they're using in the Netherlands. So um, we're basically kind of in a proof of concept phase with that, and we are doing a lot of um, tuber testing actually now in parallel with our post-harvest test. So all seed lots are being post-harvest tested in Hawaii, and many of them are also being tested, being evaluated um, in duplicate with uh, dormant tuber testing. And um, there are many programs, um, many factor or many uh, sectors in our industry um, that are demanding um, dormant tuber testing. And one of the main reasons is that you can receive answers earlier. So uh, with our post-harvest test in Hawaii, we get our results back about the third week of January on the tuber testing that we're doing right now, we've got some results already. So um, very feasibly having results in November and December. So uh, that allows people in the industry to make decisions more quickly and, uh, and plan ahead for the next growing season. Uh, what proportion of North American seed is certified? Um, I don't have an actual percentage, but the vast majority is certified. Um, in some states, they do have rules where you can grow seed for one year outside of certification um, to increase for commercial production. But um, throughout the US, most state is certified and most states have certified seed laws that actually uh, dictate that certified seed must be used to plant their crops. So Andy Robinson from North Dakota, how would herbicide residues be detected in dormant tuber testing? And this is one of the things that I did not talk about. And that is when you compare dormant tuber testing to a field grow out, um, you really do lose a significant amount of information um, because you can't detect things like varietal mix or herbicide residues or damage in dormant tubers. So that is a very significant issue. So um, that's why at this point in time, I am a big proponent of um, doing kind of a hybrid system where we're still doing a field grow out and then we do a duplicate sample early so that we can get early information for our growers. Because yes, I think it's extremely important um, that you are able to observe things like herbicide injury. And, you know, even in the greenhouse, they can see significant um, growth effects from herbicides in those very, very small greenhouse grown plants. So uh, that is something that's lost with dormant tuber testing. Uh, another question, um, is Europe all dormant seed testing? 
I think the vast majority at this point is dormant seed testing. There were uh, many countries that were do doing a grow out very similar in greenhouses to what I showed. Um, but as far as I know, um, the vast majority of Europe at this point is dormant seed testing. Okay, well, thank you for the questions. And um, again, I hope that I am able to attend the World Potato Congress in Ireland and that I will see many of you there and we can have these great discussions in Ireland.